But I don't want you. She said, you mean you're going to turn away my money? I said, no, no, no. You, you, need, you need to hear what I'm saying. Y'all gave me a vision. We're going to do God's work. And your money is absolutely no good. She said, well, if I stop tithing, you won't get paid. I said, well, that's great. You don't pay me to begin with. She said, well, the church will be able to pay you. I said, you understand. The church doesn't pay me. God pays me. Here's what I learned. Don't ever let somebody hold you over a barrel with money. Because money is just paper with a book. And don't you know that God is the master of preacher? And God can create whatever he needs for his people. Now, I said all that to say this. We all have enemies. That day, I gained an enemy. In fact, all over the county, this woman did everything she could to stop us moving forward. And every time, God broke down the barrier. And we kept pressing forward. I remember the day the building was done and we were running over 225 people. I will never forget. She pulled in the parking lot one day, never would come in. I was standing up front. She pulled in the parking lot, turned around, and she stopped the motion for me to come out there. I walked out there and she said, Well, you did it, didn't you? I said, No. I didn't do it. But God did. Amen. God built a $1.5 million building for just a little over $300,000. Wow. Turnkey. Done. Completed. You know why he did that? Because that was his plan all along. He got great glory out of it. Great. Magnificent praise. But if we had done it her way, guess who would have gotten glory from it? She would have. God said, I'm not sharing my glory with anybody. But you will have enemies. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. Maybe you had some enemies in your life growing up. And I don't know what size of enemies that you had. But I don't even know that this, as Christians, we are always in a fight. And we may have enemies down here. But I don't even know that we have a greater enemy who is our arch enemy. And his name is. Satan. He hates us because he hates God. He hates everything that God stands for. I think it's common in our culture today. We use the word Hitler to describe an evil person. But Satan is the father, the creator, and the ultimate practitioner of evil. Nothing any earthly tyrant has ever been able to do anything that would compare to the hatred that Satan has for mankind and the lengths for which he was willing to go to inflict worry on each one of us. So whether we like it or not, we're in a fight. The fight. And we have to respond one way or another. You see, the enemy will fight you in your personal life. He fights against everything that God ordains, such as the replanting of his church. I want you to understand if those things are happening, in fact, I'm doing a beach baptism this Thursday night as a result of this church. You understand God is changing people's lives? Look at what COVID-19 has done. COVID-19 has made us no longer a neighborhood church, no longer a regional church. We have people today in many cities across the U.S. who are giving financially every single week to support the ministries of this church. They're giving the special things that we're doing. They are getting out of their community and they're ministering and serving in the name of Grace Way Church. Is that not exciting? Boy, it is to me because I believe that's what Jesus meant when he said, Go in the all to every preacher. Can you imagine that one day there might be a Grace Way Church in Indianapolis, Indiana because there were 10 people who believed in the vision of what we were doing here and they got together and they started worshiping with us every Sunday online and started giving and then eventually they were beginning to grow and then eventually they called a pastor and then, you see what I'm saying? They called the vision and one vision 
because of the faithfulness of us. As we press forward with God's vision. Now you wonder why the enemy would want to stop the replanting of this church? Now you understand why the enemy would say, I'm going to squash that in the beginning before it gets you out of hand? Because the lives are being changed. The enemy is angry. He is mad. Now, does it look like anything we've ever done before? Absolutely not. But this COVID-19, the days that we're living in, look like anything that we've known before? No. 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 Guess what? I believe that God is shaking our world up. I believe He's getting us ready for something greater. We have played church. We have played religion for way too long in this world. And Jesus said, listen, I'm getting the church ready for the church that I'm coming back for. It is the church of Jesus Christ. One that we without spot, without blemish. That's the church Jesus is coming back for. It is the bride of Christ. But it's amazing. How the enemy will always attack you at the point of your commitment. We cannot think for a moment that the enemy is going to lie down and just let us about the father's business of impacting the lives of people with the gospel of God's grace and think that it's okay. So look with me for just a moment in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. I want you to understand here the word that Peter is speaking. And just as it was for that day, those believers, we too must listen to the words of Peter and take it to heart today because I believe we're in a battle in a spiritual warfare. I don't care what you call it. I don't care how you see it. But we are still there. It doesn't change the fact that we are. 1 Peter 5, 8, 9, get your Bibles or it's on the screen behind me. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom you may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. You see, when Peter begins to speak to those believers who are scattered all throughout the regions of the ancient Galatia and so forth and so on, in chapter 5, all up until this time, he has been giving them some great advice to help them in living out the Christian life. But now we find where Peter has changed gears, if you will. He changes gears and he goes from an encouragement mode and a teaching mode to a warning mode. You see, I believe it's high time that we in the church need some people stand up and wave the flag that says, warning, warning, warning. Because here's what happens. We keep doing church the way we've always done church. And when I say that, I'm not talking about this church. I'm talking about the church, Big C, the church of God around the world. We've got to stop doing church our way and start doing church God's way. That's, where, that's why we are where we are right now. We've gotten comfortable. We've gotten settled. We've gotten so relaxed in doing church our way. And as we've done it our way, we've seen the world fall by the wayside. So it's an understanding why we're not having an impact on the lives of people anymore. What is wrong with us? I'll tell you what's wrong with us. We've gotten away from God's plan and we've done it our way. And I don't want to Sounds good. We waste a lot of time on it. We waste a lot of money and our resources on it. But it does not work. God's way is the only way that is guaranteed to work. It is His plan that will always succeed. Peter says in a great startle warning, be sober. But what does that mean? What does it mean to be sober? It means don't be under the influence of. Listen, I believe with all my heart the church today has been lulled to sleep because we have been under the influence of the world rather than them being under our influence. You see, I don't understand. <coughs> Listen. When we begin to act like the world, when we begin to accept what the world does as legitimate and as godly, we have missed the mark. In fact, we are called out, as Ecclesia, the called out ones, to stand out among the crowd, to be different, to be peculiar, to be weird. You know, that's the problem. We don't want to be weird. 
I remember some churches that I led in times past. I mean, staff meeting. And here's what staff would always say. Well, Pastor Lee, what are the other churches doing? I don't know. That's what we don't want to do. <laughs> Amen? If it ain't working for them, what well, the world makes us think it would work for us. See, that's where you get trouble. Instead of the way you say what works in other churches, or, or what is the life way to say it works? Here's what we do. We look for a silver bullet. You ever notice that? When the church is dying, we look for a silver bullet because surely LifeWay has a program they put out that if we'll follow that program, it'll fix it, it'll turn us around. If it could have, it would have. Amen. Amen? In fact, LifeWay is twirling down the tubes and probably won't be long before they'll be completely out of business. And if it didn't work for LifeWay, what makes us think it'll work for us? But what would it look like if we got on our face before God and said, God, what do you want us to do? Well, what a novel idea. That God might have a special purpose and calling for this church. It won't look the same as Shiloh. It won't look the same as First Dover. It won't look the same as Spring Head United Methodist. It won't look the same as all these other churches. You know why? Because we are unique to the community that God has put us in. Yeah. When you look around within a five hour radius of this building right here, the median age is 32 years old. Here's the problem with that nobody's preaching. Oh, by the way, 32 years old. In the 30s, they're the ones who have children. They're the ones who have teenagers. So I said, why don't we just raise people like us? Because we won't be here in 10 years. Well, why don't we just raise people like us? Are we really okay with our community dying and going to hell? Are we really okay? Yes, we are. You know why we are? Because the devil's told us that, and we fall in hook, line, and sinker. If we just come to church and get really, really busy doing religious stuff, we we'll think we're making impact for the kingdom while the rest of the world dies and goes to hell in a handbasket. That is wrong. It doesn't happen that way. He should be sober. Watch out. Be careful. He's just told not to worry. But to be sober. Sober means to be awake. Sober means to be alert. Be serious minded in your approach to life. Be suddenly to be intelligent concerning the strategies of the enemy, Satan. Do you realize that spiritual warfare starts right here? It always starts in the mind. The enemy will always plant a seed in your mind. You're not good enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not handsome enough. You're not talented enough. You're a failure. You don't have the skills for that. You never were anything. You'll never be anything. You don't have enough money. You don't have enough education. You see the lies that the enemy deposits in your mind? And the moment that lie, that seed, is planted in the soul of your mind, you begin to think on it. And all day long, you walk around. And whether you're consciously thinking about it or subliminally thinking about it, here's what happens. In your mind, you're walking around rehearsing that lie. I'm not good enough. Nobody wants me. Nobody will ever love me. I'm not good enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not handsome enough. I don't have what it takes. I'm a failure. I'm washed up. I'm broken. You see, you begin to tell yourself that. It becomes a broken record. 
You know, the only person who likes a broken record is the one who owns it. That's the only person that sees any value in a broken record. Well, I want that thing way back when. It was valuable. I made a lot of money from that broken record. It wasn't broken back then. But nobody wants to hear that broken record play over, over, and over, and over in your mind. And the more you play it, the more it gets ingrained in your spirit. And it creates a stronghold in your mind. It creates a stronghold in your spirit. He says, be sober and intelligent concerning the strategies of the enemy. Listen, when he speaks a lie in your spirit, you rise up and you say, devil, you're a liar. I rebuke you. Get out in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why is it we keep taking in those lies? We keep listening to what he says. He says, not only to be sober, but he says, be vigilant. Vigilant. What does it mean to be vigilant? That they should be so prepared to be every attack that the wicked one would throw their way. To be vigilant. I think it's amazing. When you look at the enemy, we all think that the enemy has one way that he appears. And he doesn't. In fact, he's very predictable if you understand how he operates. God works in a million different ways and he never works the same way twice. That's the goodness of our God. But the enemy, he is not that smart. He is not that bright. In fact, Peter says if you'll be sober and if you'll be vigilant, if you'll wake up if you will be only alert, if you'll be cautious, if you'll look around at your surroundings. God, the church is sitting asleep. We have been asleep for decades. Well, I don't know why we don't have a move of God in our church like they used to years and years ago. I can tell you why we don't. We're asleep. When the Holy Spirit shows up, He moves and shows up. Or, if we do recognize it, we believe a lie of the enemy about it. Let me show you what I mean. There are three poses of the enemy. The first one is a snake. Now listen, when you and I see a snake, we know a snake. Amen? I hate snakes. In fact, one time, I brought to the platform of the church I was pastor this box. Marty was a white box, had holes in it, and it, it, it just said on the side of it, live. It's all set. And I had this little recording in it, and it went, it just played and played and played. And I just said over the side, nobody said a word, nobody said a word, and I got to preach, I just kept playing the music, and I walked over. And it lures. I 
Now, some people say, you look around our country today, and I'm not going into political realms, I'm not a political guy, but you got people that say, oh, this was the Antichrist, and that was the Antichrist. And listen, the spirit of the Antichrist has been here for ages. It's been operating all the way around the world, and nobody's cared to recognize it until now. I don't know who the Antichrist is. I really don't care who the Antichrist is. But what I do know is the spirit of the Antichrist is just as bad, and that's not necessarily a person. It is a spirit. It's demonic in nature, and we need to see it and call it as such. Amen. And then there's a third dose. It's a roaring one. That's where we are here. In 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. Did, did you see? Did you see what he said? Did you get it? Look at him again. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because, here's the plot. Your adversary, your enemy, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. Seeking. Then he made it out. Guys, that's where we are. We're living in the day where evil is no longer hidden. Evil is brought out, parading itself down the street, and we're calling what is evil good and what is good evil. Hello? We got a problem. We're right where Peter says he is a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. The one who is fearful, terrorizing God's people through persecution. That's where we're at. A roaring lion. Mm -hmm. Who cares about the snake anymore? Who cares about the angel of light anymore? What about a roaring lion that would get right up in your face and say, I am sin, I am wicked, I am evil. Roar! Look at me now. Family. 
Somebody just told me just the other day, they wouldn't listen to one of my sermons online. They said, oh, boy, they said, you are not going to grow a great church like that. You need to change how you preach because that is not the style of preaching that people like anymore. Well, <laughs> <laughs> No, the Bible says we're 
get on there and blast back their view. I looked over and I went, I disagree, but I still love you. What happened to those days? I don't care if you vote the way I vote. I don't care if you disagree with me on something. It's okay. We are still brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. If we did get along down here, uh oh, if you guys have been turning to me in heaven. <laughs> we disagree, and I can still hug your neck and shake your hand when I'm here in COVID 19. But <laughs> I can still. Love you, I'm still your pastor, I'm still minister to you. This past week, there's a couple who left our church that disagreed. This was months ago. Mm -hmm. They disagreed. Mm -hmm. And I saw them out of town this past week. And they turned, they were going the opposite direction. Let me tell you, I had never moved so fast through Walmart in all my life. I ran around, I got down there and put the other aisle, and I got the other aisle, and I come up and I go, oh, hey, how y'all doing? It's so good to see y'all. Man, how y'all doing? And I stood there and talked, and then people who sat there and talked to me, I said, we have a disagreement. We didn't fall out. We're, we're still brothers and sisters. You're saved, I'm saved, we're still going to heaven. I will always speak. Our family has been hit hard, hard spiritual warfare. 